Hi, and welcome to Answers News for Thursday, June the 13th. I'm Avery Foley. I'm here with Roger Patterson. It's just the two of us uh, doing the whole thing today. Bodie bailed on us Yeah, today, Bodie so bailed, we're... so it's just us. Uh, but thankfully you're here and it's not just me by myself. <laughs> so thank you for coming. <laughs> Glad to be back again. We have a wonderful live studio audience. You guys want to clap and say hello? People can hear you, but they can't see you. But thank you for <laughs> thank you for coming and joining us today. Yes. We've got people from all over the country. We're we do. Uh, lots of places. Still no Idaho. I'm still waiting for that Idaho person to show up in the audience. <laughs> we had some Canadians when I was speaking earlier today. There was a couple of different couples who were from Canada, so that was always nice to see. But sorry, there's nobody from Idaho yet. Uh -huh. I'm sure there's some people in Idaho, so maybe they'll jump on online. <laughs> All right, well, while we're waiting for people to get on here, uh, first thing we wanted to mention is enrollment is open at 12 Stones Christian Academy, which is uh, a biblical worldview Christian school associated with Answers in Genesis. Uh, it's here in Northern Kentucky. Really, really great, exciting school. It's pretty, pretty new, um, but they're accepting applications for this fall from kindergarten through grade nine. So if you yeah. have I think this is the first manage. year that ninth grade will be yes. coming online. Yep. So the first year high school is offered through 12 stones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so pretty exciting. So if you have a student who's in those grades, you can um, go to tschristianacademy.org to learn more about the school um, and also to, to book a tour so you can come and kind of talk to some of the teachers and see the facility and all that. Um, we'd love to, to get to show you around there. I'm sure the, um, the teachers and whatnot down there would love to meet you. Uh, so, all right, we got, uh, here we go. We can start looking at comments. Looks We've like got people from Indiana, Indiana online. Carrie from the audience Idaho. is here. Idaho. Oh, we get it. I'll oh, see. Now there's somebody from Idaho. They're recovering from spinal surgery and they're listening. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Some people did the um, incredible race, VBS. Kids loved it. We love hearing it's VBS season. We're constantly hearing from people saying how much the kids are loving the incredible race. So that's really, uh, really exciting. Yep. Um, and next year's is already, you can, I think you can already pre-order next year's. Um, which yes, is really we've exciting. announced the theme of uh, Mystery Island Mystery a couple Island. weeks ago. Yep. It'll be out teaching on the attributes of God, working through those things. It looks mm -hmm. really good, really good. So great to see so many people on. We got Kentucky, Northern North Carolina, Kansas, Texas, Oregon, Florida. Awesome. Lots All right. Of great stuff. So our first fluff item. I, I, I saw really this. Just, I put this in the I can't believe this is real category. It, it, it's just okay. So this this headline. Godzilla grew 30 times faster than any organism on Earth. Here's why. And here's how the article begins. If Godzilla were a real creature, his incredible, incredibly rapid growth spurt on the big screen would be off the charts, even setting evolutionary records, a new report finds. But wait. <laughs> He's not a real creature. He's so not. Why are we even talking about so this? So there's this whole scientific terms report in a scientific journal. In a scientific journal, yes, about Godzilla and why is Godzilla so big? Because back in 1954, so a little bit before my time, uh, Godzilla was only 164 feet tall. But now, 35 films. I had no idea they've made 35 Godzilla that's films. That's across all the different countries. Like, who yeah, adapted that's a lot of films. Idea. 35 Godzilla films later, he is now 393 feet tall. So he in He's grown a little bit in the last yeah. little while. And so they're trying to account for his growth. He's a fictional character that people drew. But anyway, they're trying to account for how much he grew. And they think it's because of the existential dread experienced by humanity. So now that we're like all afraid of and we're reacting to like geopolitical instability and terrorism and climate change, our monsters just keep getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, but the, the crazy thing to me looking at this from a scientific perspective they tried to connect it. I can understand some sociological right, commentary yeah. on this, how that how that ties to uh, the monster stands for this or that cultural fear, and we're fighting it together and coming together to save humanity. But then they start tying it to things like um, genetic drift. The monster's growth is also far too rapid to come from genetic drift, which is a real biological genetic <laughs> phenomenon. <laughs> well, no, duh, because it didn't actually have any genetic material character. to drift. And on top of that, it totally uh, just underscores the, it, it just boggles my mind because individuals don't evolve. Populations over time can change but not even the evolutionists would think an individual right, can yeah. evolve. Right, so yeah, so even in an evolutionary worldview, it isn't, own, yeah, it isn't consistent, so mm -hmm. yeah, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I think it's probably, we could just chalk this up to people like bigger, scarier monsters, and we have bigger, better CGI. Yeah, you know, I mean, stuff. I think the Godzilla in 1954 is probably not as cool looking as the 2019 version yeah. of Godzilla. Like, I haven't seen a lot of, uh, 
scary films from the 1950s, but I have a feeling there's a bit of a difference, probably. <laughs> All right, this next one is another fluff one that's kind of cute. Frogs find refuge in elephant tracks. Study says pachyderm puddles are amphibian condos. Yeah, this was interesting. So as, as they study these populations, uh, this one is focused on Asian elephants. And as they move from water holes and things, they would leave little uh, footprints in the mud and areas. And then as it would rain, those puddles would fill up. And that would offer amphibians like frogs and, and toads a place to come and deposit their eggs. And then the tadpoles would develop there. And so it creates what we would think of as a little micro environment mm -hmm. where they can uh, develop and that would happen pretty rapidly. But to, to think of the interconnectedness of all of these things and how elephants and the massive amount of vegetation they consume and trees they knock down and, and trackways they make where they, where they go through areas frequently, uh, we really think of them as environmental engineers in a sense because they're mm -hmm. changing environments as they work in those. And uh, just the interconnectedness of all of life on earth as God's designed it to cooperate together in various ways and work together. Mm -hmm. It's just a reminder that as we, as we think about how uh, we are to be stewards of the environment, how damaging one thing can lead to consequences we might not even think of. So you wouldn't normally think, oh, if we didn't have any elements, elephants, we sh might lose the frogs. But indeed, that's the case that they're looking at here in this study. Someone says that's totally true. Totally true. <laughs> Good one, Kevin. <laughs> All right, so moving into our like official, official news, now that we've got a whole bunch of people jumped on here. This one comes from Christian Headlines. Um, are my one slide ahead? Oh, I don't have a slide for this one. All right, so oh, okay. um, it's because it was left over from last week. I, must have, I forgot to move it over. That's my fault. Sorry about that. All right, Australian Catholic schools to teach that God is gender neutral. So Catholic schools in Brisbane, Australia, um, are apparently going to begin teaching their students to use gender neutral pronouns for God and to drop using words like Lord, Son, Father, sort of gendered terms in relation to God and instead just use gender neutral terms um, because they say God is neither male nor female. But that really goes back to the point of uh, the authority of scripture. And mm -hmm. as one of the uh, quotes here from the article, uh, they talk about uh, making these changes so that our community deepens their understanding of who God is for them, how God reveals God's self through creation, our relationships with others in the person of Jesus. And so it's all about the individual's experience, who God is mm -hmm. for them. The individual is making up their mind about who God is, how they want to relate God to God. God isn't the authority anymore. Yeah. We the, are. And the, notice the Bible is missing from there. They'll yeah. look to natural creation, mm -hmm. but not the, the supernatural revelation that we have. Mm -hmm. And they mention that God has revealed himself through the person of Jesus, which he has, and Jesus was male. Mm -hmm. So yeah. why, why do they, <laughs> um, one of the most interesting questions to me is, is these liberal leaning Christians who are claiming they're looking to the Bible as the authority, totally abandon it in areas like this. And then when mm -hmm. we uh, also consider how they are promoting those in uh, different communities who want to create their own gender identities and be called by their own personal pronouns, whatever they choose for their pronouns, uh, they would promote those ideas. But yet God has indeed revealed his pronouns and he uses masculine pronouns. He right, so they let other the people father. choose their own pronouns, but they won't let God choose his own pronouns. Yeah, and um, it's just totally, I mean, We know totally God ironic. is spirit. God is in like us, um, but he's chosen to reveal himself to us in his word using masculine pronouns. So we can't just arbitrarily decide we don't want to do yeah. that. And it's absolutely true that um, we wouldn't think of of God the Father having a gender in the sense that right, we do yeah. in, our, in our bodies, but uh, we definitely see him revealing himself as Father, and that's how he's chosen to do that. But there are also places in Scripture where we get uh, more of what might be thought of as the feminine side of uh, the attributes of God as they're expressed in humanity. So mm -hmm. he's compared to a mother hen and other things that um, protecting her chicks and those types of caring ideas. But that doesn't mean I am a man and I'm never caring and loving to my children right, or yeah. others. 
So we need, to, we need to be careful with those ideas and make sure that we're looking to the Bible as our authority in those areas. And it really goes back to this whole idea that there is really no male or female genders on a spectrum. You can choose whatever you want, which goes against what scripture teaches. Scripture is very clear, Genesis 127. We have been created male and female. We don't have the authority to start redefining that. Um, so as, as believers, we need to get back to that, the authority of the word of God and not allow the thinking of the culture to impact um, how we view scripture and how yeah. we and the other uh, understand that issue. Interesting aspect here. So this is coming out of a, a, a set of Catholic schools mm -hmm. in, in Australia. And um, within the Catholic tradition, there isn't really a huge appeal to the authority of scripture. The church is also an authority right, structure yeah. and tradition is an authority structure. Uh, so they don't necessarily hold to the Bible as the absolute authority. They have other structures in place. So that allows groups like this, this group of bishops that's mentioned in the article, to endorse ideas like this. Um, so we, have a, we do have a resource if anybody's interested in finding out more things like that. This is our World Religions and Cults series. Uh, it's a three-volume series that Bodhi Hodge and I worked on together. Uh, this first volume, which is called The Counterfeits of Christianity, includes religions like Jehovah's Witness and Mormons and um, Islam and Roman Catholicism, Orthodox uh, faiths like Greek Orthodox, talks about how they've um, strayed away from the Bible as the absolute authority and brought in ideas of man uh, and attached those to scripture. Uh, so anybody looking for more information on those types of things could find that in this book series. It's a great resource, yeah. And I have appendix in book number three, so. <laughs> Someone here asked if the elephants have toad jam. Oh, <laughs> that's just bad. Too bad, exceedingly bad. Well, a couple people in the audience laughed, so, you know. <laughs> All right. Now we got our slide for this one. Iridescent bones of a lost dinosaur herd discovered in an opal mine. So I had no idea that fossils, instead of being fossilized, like they could be fossilized by opals, by the, um, uh, the silicate, so, sil is that how silica. you pronounce it? Yeah, silica. It's silica. <laughs> <laughs> could um, form opals in, like replace the, the uh, minerals in the bones with this opal. So it's really cool. Like you look at the picture and it's like all iridescent and-, and Mine um, looks all black and white. Huh? Well, <laughs> it's black and white on the paper. On the screen, it's on really screen. pretty. Uh, so this, they found these opals back in the 1980s. A miner found them and his children recently donated them so that they could be studied. Uh, and they found that they're actually kind of bits and pieces from four different individuals, including some juveniles um, from dinosaurs that could have been up to 16 and a half feet long in life, uh, which is uh, kind of neat. So they think this is a new species. I've identified it as a new species. I'm not even going to try and pronounce the it's name. It's some interesting, probably aboriginal word, Fostoria dimbangunmal. The Fostoria that's, comes that's from the name one. of the yeah. guy Foster, the other one. <laughs> who found them, but the last part, um, I'm not going to try and pronounce. Uh, but it, uh, what I thought was really interesting is they're talking about how this area of Australia, um, they believe had to have been a floodplain in the past because they find marine fossils there. And then they occasionally will find land animals mixed in with those marine fossils. So they think, okay, well, um, these land animals must have somehow gotten washed out to the ocean and then eventually fossilized or opalized in this case. But how do you have an entire herd, uh, an entire family, at least four individuals of dinosaurs washed out to sea all at the same time? Well, you have to have a catastrophe to do that. So um, when you look at all of the fossil record, including this, one, um, it makes sense to look at this through the lens of a biblical worldview, that there was a catastrophe, the global flood of Noah's day, um, as opposed to the slow, gradual processes we observe in the present. Yeah, and when we think about the, uh, the silica minerals that are involved here and uh, the different forms that they can take when, when they harden into rock, opal's just one of those types. And so it's very intriguing to find this, this uh, silica, uh, it's actually a mineraloid technically, but this silica compound um, we would find that in lots of other fossils, but here it's unique in the opals, and we get these beautiful uh, layers of the of the uh, mineral substance that reflect the light and refract the light in different mm. ways, give opals that shimmer and all the different colors we see. And to me, that's just another reminder that God has created His this world in amazing ways, and the way all the different elements fit together. I, mm -hmm. I was just teaching on chemistry to our Explore Camp kids on Tuesday, talking about the periodic table. All these pieces are just more reminders of God's um, 
manifold beauty and creation. Everywhere we look, we see new aspects of that. That's really cool. And, and they often talk about opals forming within you know, long um, time spans. But actually, in, in the lab, they can create opals that look virtually identical to um, natural forming opals within just a couple of weeks. So it doesn't take long um, periods of time to make opals like yeah, we Yeah, so to fit think. this within the time frame following the flood about 4,300 yeah. years ago is very reasonable. And the flood explains opals really well. We actually have an article on our website um, called Rapid Opals on the Outback, which they're going to link to in the comments here. So if you want to take a look at it and kind of learn more about how opals formed, that's a really great article um, for you to take a look at. So they'll put that, the social media team will put that in the comments for you. All right, next one. Oh, this one is really cool. I really liked this one. An incredible fossil contains a whole school of 259 fish. So talking about catastrophic processes. So this is a fossil from um, the... Um, uh, da, 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 where? Green, Green River, River formation. formation. It was green something yep. in Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah. But it's actually they found it in Japan. It's on display at a museum in Japan. So it came from the United States and it's in Japan now. Uh, and this this guy was looking through the museum and he's looking at the dinosaurs. And then all of a sudden he sees this incredible fossil. So he decided to study it. And based on on their uh, mathematical models, it it does indeed appear to be a school of fish that was fossilized swimming while they're swimming um, in this school, which is really cool. Yeah, and, and here we have. Uh, the description in the article says 259 tiny fish bodies with eyes and spines and even fins. That level of intricate detail that's preserved in these fossils is just a clear indicator that these things were buried quickly before there could be any uh, massive decomposition of their body parts. Everything's intact. Everybody's mm -hmm. still basically headed in the same direction. Uh, when they did some of the mathematical modeling to try and understand whether these were trapped and then kind of tumbled in a flow, that doesn't make sense because they're all pointed the same direction. Could it have been a current flow? Could it have been a dune sliding underwater and burying them? All of these things don't really add up, but if you had uh, some type of an underwater current with lots of sediment in it, like we'd likely find in the flood, we can see how these fish would be swimming against that current and then get rapidly buried as that sediment starts to fall out of, of the current flow. And uh, places all over the world have evidence of this type of flow. We think of Dr. Steve Austin's work on the nautiloids that are in the Grand Canyon. Yes, yeah. Mass kills that happen in those areas. Uh, just clear evidence that these things happen the same quickly. Way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was interesting in the article, they're talking about other finds where they found a whole bunch of fish. They tend to find a lot of them kind of jumbled up, not pristine in a school like this. And they say, well, that's indicative of a school of fish dying, sinking to the bottom of the lake and slowly being buried in sediment. Well, I grew up on a farm. We have a pond on the farm that was stocked with fish. You go swimming and you get a snorkel on and, and a mask and you go down. You don't see dead fish laying on the bottom of the pond waiting to be fossilized. And if you do the same thing on the lake, or the ocean, you don't find a bunch of dead fish laying there waiting to be fossilized. That doesn't, we don't observe that in the present. They're eaten by other fish. They're broken down by oxygen and microbes um, and, and, you know, scavengers. So why do they assume this happened in the past? Well, because somehow they have to explain the billions of fossils that we find all around the world um, and the slow and gradual processes are how they try and explain that, but it doesn't match with what we see in the present. They might take an instantaneous short-term catastrophe view, but they would never accept something large scale right, like yeah. the worldwide flood. Simply because the Bible mentioned it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, the next one here. Some people are saying that's kind of a cool um, find, which is cool. It is indeed. And some people from Canada on. That's great. I always love to have fellow Canadians on. David on here from Australia. And we did get a nod from way up in Moscow, Idaho. That's way up north. I'm from down south. But <laughs> close enough. Another person from Idaho. There you go. <laughs> Uh, this comes from Global News. Man arrested after allegedly shouting derogatory comments in Church Wellesley Village. So this comes out of Canada uh, um, in Toronto. Uh, they basically was like a gay village in Toronto is where this took place. And this gentleman was street preaching. He had a microphone and he was preaching. Um, and he, he was talking about, uh, mentioned the gospel, was talking about um, God being uh, love and uh, we need to repent, put our faith and trust in Christ regardless of who we are, we need to repent. Um, and talking about tolerance and how... Um, um, the LGBT community is often not very tolerant of Christians. And some of his comments could, could be taken as kind of a bit antagonizing and maybe a bit inflammatory, but his tone was always very calm. He didn't get all worked up, but the crowd around him got super worked up and they started blocking his path so he couldn't walk, yelling things at him, kind of pushing him, things like that. Uh, and eventually the police were called. The police came and arrested him for um, disturbing the peace. And he has, a, I think his, in July, he will be... Uh, 
uh, yeah, his yeah. trial or yeah. whatever will take place in, in July. Um, I, this just popped in my head listening to Acts this morning, how uh, they were preaching in a certain city and they were uh, stormed the, the area and started preaching or just yelling, great is Diana. Yes, and, yeah, it was similar to that. to drown out the <laughs> preacher and ignore what he's trying to say. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's, a, here's another example in our culture where even speaking the truth about homosexuality being a sin, even though in his statements he clearly identified that there are heterosexual sins, it's not oh, yeah. your sexual wasn't singling orientation out one thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is the, the issue here. It's that we've violated God's law, that mm -hmm. we um, have that stain of sin on us, and that the only way to remove that stain is to turn to Christ repent of those sins, trust in what he's done to pay for those and receive his righteousness uh, in place of our sin. And that type of preaching is now called derogatory comments and mm -hmm. considered targeting members of the LGBT community for hate speech. Uh, this certainly isn't a surprise. We know this is the way uh, people have reacted to the gospel all through history mm -hmm. and since, since Christ walked the earth, even while he was on the earth. And uh, we just have to be reminded again, these are people with real souls, with real eternal destinies, and to be seeking to reach out to them with the truth, speaking the truth in love, um, turn to Christ and trust in mm -hmm. him. It's interesting that they, the, the um, police officer was talking and about the commotion and he said, people were obviously disturbed by the comments that were being made. And the fact that they were disturbed by them um, and it caused this big commotion and everything was enough to get him arrested. It wasn't necessarily what, that what he said was actually derogatory or that what he said was um, you know, in any way actual hate speech. It's that people were disturbed by the comments he made. And because they were disturbed and got all worked up, he was arrested. Yeah, it's it's become, if I feel bad about it, then you're offending me. And, mm -hmm. and that becomes hate in people's minds and, and labeled as homophobia mm -hmm. when, when indeed uh, we would hope that this man's motive is love and, and desire for them to, to turn to Christ, that God would be glorified in that. Mm -hmm. So just, we're seeing this all across the West. It's sad to see, but as believers, we need to keep speaking up, even when we see things like this happen, and we know that we could get in trouble for what we say. We need to keep speaking up and sharing the truth of the gospel, because it's the gospel that saves. All right. Uh, Miley Cyrus' insane Planned Parenthood fundraiser shows liberals are out of touch. So most people are familiar with Miley Cyrus. She's a, a pop star. Um, she's gone kind of uh, pretty, pretty left-leaning and pretty, um, her videos are, are not really appropriate anymore. Um, she used to be kind of a children's, yeah, like, Hannah Disney Montana person. Yeah, Hannah character. Montana. Mm -hmm. Not so much anymore. Um, but she is selling um, a sweater as a way to raise money for Planned Parenthood. That's a pretty inappropriate picture of her um, with, we're not going to read exactly what the sweater says because it's not fit for the show, but basically don't mess with my freedom is what the sweater says. Um, for $175, it's a very expensive sweater, you can get this. <laughs> um, but I'll, as, a, as a fundraiser for Planned Parenthood, and just this whole idea that if we are um, pro-life, if we don't believe that you should be allowed to kill children in the womb, you're messing with women's freedom. Yeah, They've I just was, redefined what that means. I was hearing a news story this morning uh, with uh, one of the uh, leading female characters in the, in the um, Democratic Party, not to make this political, but her point was that uh, she was using language that was very, um, very loaded and definitely um, propagandizing her point of view. And she's calling the, um, the new laws that are being passed like in places like Georgia the forced birth or forced pregnancy yes. laws. Mm -hmm. No one is forcing these women to become pregnant. That's the choice they've made. It's that we don't want to allow them to murder their children. So if I were to correct, again, as we do often here with these, these lines, rather than don't mess with my freedom, I'd, I'd add a little text to that, don't mess with my freedom to murder babies, because that's what they're really asking mm -hmm. to do. They don't value life. They don't mm -hmm. have um, the notion of, that, that young one in the womb being an image bearer of God and having yes. intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. And again, it's just another, um, another demonstration of 
how far people will run to rebel against God and continue mm -hmm. to, to throw that back in his face. It really shows you that the, the battle is really over two different worldviews. Like, does my autonomy and my ability to not be pregnant if I don't want to be pregnant, does my not be a mother if I don't want to be a mother, is that more important than the life of a child? And that's really, that's where the worldview clash is. If God created us and we're made in his image, then that child has dignity and worth and value and the right to life. And my selfish desires don't um, override the fact that this child has value in God's eyes and I don't have the right to take that child's life. But in a secular worldview, if it's all about me, this is the one life I have to live, I don't want anything standing in the way of my happiness and my autonomy and my ability to live this one life that I get, then you see things like this happen. So really you're seeing that clash of worldviews, that clash of, of authorities. Who will your authority be, God or, or selfish human beings, really? Absolutely. Um, so it's down there on that foundational level. Yet again, we just constantly see that that's the real battle uh, on the worldview level. This next one comes from The Scientist. Genetic mutation that prevents HIV infection tied to earlier death. Um, so this is talking about a... a allele on a gene called CCR5. I'm sure everyone's heard of it. Um, <laughs> and it's the Delta 32 allele, if you're really There you interested. go. Delta, that, oh, that's what the little triangle is, Delta. There you go. That's yeah. why we have the, the science teacher on the show. <laughs> um, if you have two copies of that, you are more likely, 21% um, 21, 21 more likely to die by the age of 73, but you um, will not get HIV. It basically, you're, it prevents that infection. Yeah. Um, you may remember recently in the news, the Chinese scientist who had edited the embryos of uh, two children and using the CRISPR technology. This was the gene uh, coding region that he dealt with in trying to uh, ensure that these two babies would be free from the effects of uh, contracting HIV in the future. And but we don't know what other changes that's going to make. Yeah. That's a problem with, with the CRISPR technology is yeah. it makes a change here, but we don't know how that change is going to affect a bunch of other Yeah. So changes. when we think about um, your genes, we know we get a copy from mom, a copy from dad, and each of those variations uh, in any given region is called an allele, in those gene regions. And so if you have two copies of this Delta 32 allele, then that's what causes this uh, decrease in longevity uh, by statistical methods, but it also seems to be linked somehow to protecting from HIV. So there's kind of a balance here. Mm -hmm. But as we continue to, uh, to look at this uh, issue, even though this says 10% of Europeans have two copies of this Delta 32 allele, um, there's, there's no telling what other things this is connected to. As we learn more and more mm -hmm. about DNA and how the pieces fit together, it's, it's becoming more and more obvious that there are layers upon layers upon layers of the way the information is mm -hmm. processed and stored. And it's just an amazingly complex system. And when we mess with one gene and mm -hmm. the regulatory regions in one, how is it gonna impact another? Mm -hmm. And that's a real, uh, it's, there's a real possibility of finding a, a cure or a preventative measure for HIV, but there are also very serious uh, ramifications of, mm -hmm. of messing up other gene pathways mm -hmm. and regulatory mechanisms. They said at the very end of the article, um, one of these researchers said, it's important to remember when working on gene editing that, quote, mutations have effects on many, many different aspects of an organism. And it's very hard to predict all of those different effects. And yet mutations are supposed to be one of the driving forces of evolution. And yet you make a teeny tiny little change here. You have two copies in, instead of one copy. All of a sudden you have all these other things. Like you're more, um, they mentioned in here, you're more susceptible to influence influenza, other things like that. Um, so it, how is this supposed to drive evolution when you just make a tiny change here and all of a sudden these other things happen? And it tends to be a downward spiral, not an upwards, onwards, we're getting better. It tends to be the exact opposite, showing that mutations really can't be the driving force of evolution. That simply doesn't work. It doesn't match with what we observe in yeah. nature. We don't, we don't get a gain in new functional characteristics out of those types of things. Mm -hmm. All right, this next one comes from Science Daily. Feathers came first and then birds. So this rewrites the evolutionary story. I think on pretty much every episode we talk about something that rewrites some aspects of the evolutionary story. This time it's about the evolution of feathers, pushing the origin of feathers back about another 100 million years, which is a relatively long period of time. <laughs> when we're talking about the evolution of this, the, the view of this evolutionary branch, yeah, that's yes, a significant yeah, amount of time. Yeah, so, um, so basically 
what they thought before was that they see, um, you know, feathers on birds, and in their view, feathered dinosaurs. They've got that here, um, so it must have evolved here. Well, now they're they're believing they're finding feathers on pterosaurs, so that pushes that way back to the common ancestor before it split off to dinosaurs and pterosaurs, and then eventually that means birds you dinosaurs. have to assume that dinosaurs and pterosaurs had a common answer, right. ancestor. Yes. So their assumptions that evolution is true are driving their conclusions. Mm -hmm. And we say all the time, the worldview is what is gonna drive the conclusions that you're gonna arrive at. Uh, looking at these from a different perspective, from our biblical perspective, we would see those as different created kinds. Mm -hmm. uh, while, while we're still not clear on a lot of the fossils that are claimed to be feathered dinosaurs, uh, there would be no reason that God couldn't put feathers on a dinosaur. Uh, there's mm -hmm. there's nothing limiting God from that. And in fact, if you think about something like an echidna or a, a <laughs> platypus, those are shocking creatures. People didn't believe they were real when Echidna's they sent them back to Europe. Eater, basically. Yeah. So when they sent them back to Europe, they thought they were fakes because nothing could be this weird. You thought but someone had just taken a bunch of parts and stitched them and together, stitched them and together. here's platypus. <laughs> so when, if we were to find legitimate fossils of dinosaurs that weren't actually birds that have Most feathers. of them are like, this feathered dinosaur. Okay, it's a bird. It's a bird. Usually that's the but interpretation. But if we, if we could, that wouldn't overthrow the biblical model. We have mm. room for that, that God could have created those kinds, and we just don't see them alive today. We just don't expect it because in, in a biblical worldview, dinosaurs are created on day six, birds are created on day five. In an evolutionary worldview, birds des descended from dinosaurs. Some evolutionists, a lot of them now, go as far as to say birds are dinosaurs. You, you read that all over the place now. Yeah. Birds are dinosaurs, birds are dinosaurs. So in their worldview, dinosaurs had to have feathers in order um, for their worldview to work, really. Yep. Um, but it was interesting. I thought, as I was reading through this article, they're talking about how um, scales, feathers, and hair, um, all the different creatures that have those specific things, all have the same genome regulatory network. So they're like, oh, well, of course, they, they could have all evolved. All these creatures have the same regulatory network. And it's like, it takes a lot more than just the same regulatory network to produce such different features that all have different genetic information that codes for those very specific different features. Yeah. Like, Dr. Menton has, has done a lot of work on that and mm -hmm. detailed those things. Uh, you can't get a feather from a scale. You can't get a hair uh, from a scale in the evolutionary perspective. It's much more complex than just um, manipulating some genetic regulatory mm -hmm. pathway to be able to get those complex structures from simple. There has to be something more there. And uh, it's, it's kind of intriguing how we can uh, analyze those different pieces. But again, it's going to come back to the worldview that's driving the interpretations. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we might have time to just do one Let's more here this real one. quick. Let's kind of we'll on do a this more one. positive note. And, yes. So this one, LifeSite News, ex-homosexual, I'm not denying who I really am because I was never that in the first place. So this is talking about a gentleman who marched um, at the recent Freedom March in Washington, D.C., talking about his, um, he, he used to live the gay lifestyle and he could not find freedom in it. He, he just, uh, he tried all these different things and nothing brought freedom. And then he found Jesus Christ and he found that the Lord just transformed him. And he says, the Lord has called me by my name, not by my struggles. He gave me identity, hope, and purpose. It's just a really positive article pointing to the change that Christ brings, that people who are in this community, they're searching for identity. And they've been told by the world, you will find your identity if you just embrace a homosexual lifestyle or a transgender lifestyle, whatever the case may be. Or just try whatever you want to, yeah. whatever makes you feel good. You're seeking your own personal satisfaction identity in those things. That'll but, give you freedom, but yeah. that doesn't give you freedom. And that it, just you're makes slave you a to slave sin. to sin. And yeah. here we see this was a wonderful, wonderful article pointing to uh, just the, the transformation that comes from Christ. And he says here, I know I'm not alone and to see all the lives transformed by Christ is proof enough for me that it's not Christianity that's calling people out of their gay lives, but it's Christ alone. Mm -hmm. So he's, he has found his true identity in Christ. And uh, that's, that's really the goal of our ministry as we talk about creation, evolution, all these things. Mm -hmm. We want to be constantly pointing people back to Christ. It's not in, uh, in the ideas of man. It's not in philosophies. It's not in uh, the lifestyle that you live, the things that you get to do that you find your identity. It's finding who you are, created in the image of God, um, that Christ has died for your sins, trusting in him, 
that is where we really want to be pointing people. Absolutely, absolutely. So that was just a really positive, encouraging article showing the power of the gospel. And I love what he said about it's not Christianity that frees people, it's Christ. It's not following rules. It's not, okay, this is what God's word says. So I'm just gonna like just obey these things and hope that everything works out. It's no, it's Jesus Christ. And he transforms our hearts and makes us want to obey his word and absolutely. want to follow him. So that's where the tr real transformation comes. It's in Jesus Christ alone. Um, so on that note, we will conclude for today. Hopefully you can join us again on Monday. I'm not sure who will be here on Monday. I think I'm supposed to be back on Monday. I'll check my calendar. Um, but hopefully you can join us again on Monday. Uh, so God bless. Have a great day.